Some 18 years ago, I left Dayton, Ohio with two very bad knees. And a dream to become a Major League Baseball player. I thank God that dream came true. <laughs> but it wasn't always easy. In Mike Schmidt's rookie season, he hit just 196 with 18 home runs and drew some tough love from then manager Danny Ozark. I said, You're going to hit the way I want you to hit, or you can take off. I says, your damn 198 average didn't impress me or anybody else, and your 245 average over there didn't impress me. Well, Mike did take off on a first ballot Hall of Fame career. He played 18 seasons, all of them in Philly. Ten times an all-star, three times the most valuable player. And in 1980, he helped lead the Phillies to their first pennant in 30 years. Pitch to Schmidt. Long drive to left field. He buried it. He buried it way back. Out of here. Home run. Mike Schmidt puts the Phillies up 6 to 4. Oh, what a drive by Schmidt. Unbelievable. Well, Pete Rose told me back then I was the best player in the game. <laughs> what, what Pete Rose said at that time, I believe. And uh, knowing that, knowing that Pete thought that, because Pete was, had a pretty good eye for who was playing the game well. Uh, really fueled my confidence. That confidence reached an all-time high in 1980 when the Phillies won their first World Series title ever. And Schmidt was named both league and World Series MVP. The 1980 uh, um, playoffs World Series celebration the following day in the city down, the, down Broad Street in Philadelphia of 7 million people, a ticker tape parade, I think will be forever documented in this city. That was one of the great moments in Philadelphia sports history. Get out of here. Get to deep left center. Get up, get up. Out of, out of here, home run. Michael Jack Schmidt and the Phillies lead it four to nothing. I felt that 1981 was the pinnacle the high point in terms of performance for Mike Schmidt. I set some standards for myself as a player, defensively and offensively that year, that, that were going to be awful tough to live up to for the, the rest of my career. Right back and off the glove, and he will not. Mike Schmidt, what a play to get him! Whoa, whoa, look at this. What a play Mike Schmidt made. If there was any fun on the field, for me, it was the great play. I, mean, I would work on the great play. I, I, never, I didn't like to work on routine ground balls. I liked to work on, uh, you know, the tough ones and the strange ones. And, you know, the easy play for me was the high chopper in the infield. You had a bare hand or the ball way deep in the hole or way behind third. That was a play I had fun with. That's where I got my notoriety, making the great play. And Mike Schmidt is going to bat. He will bat, seeking home run number 500 with runners at first and third, two down in the night. And you talk about a home run being important. And 3-0, and I told myself, now go with what got you here. Get down on that ball, and he threw me a knee-high fastball, and I swung right down through it in the ball. A 3-0 pitch. Swag and low and drive! There it is! Number 500! The career 500th home run for Michael Jack Smith! I knew as soon as I hit it, it was a home run. And that allowed me to react emotionally. I didn't plan that. It was not choreographed. Uh, uh, maybe if I had it to do over, I could have, you know, hot dogged it a little bit more, take a little more time. But I was so happy. Great players do great things. That's a great thing you just saw there. End of story. Not quite. Schmidt went on to hit 548 home runs, earned respect as the greatest third baseman ever. Joining Schmidt at the Hall of Fame induction ceremonies this weekend, fellow former Philly, Richie Ashburn. Ashburn was a center fielder who led the majors in outfield putouts a record nine times. He had 234 stolen bases, scored more than 1,300 runs, and he hit over 300 nine times. Because of my speed, I didn't really get involved in any slumps. If I topped the ball or I could bunt, I was a good bunter. I think the longest I went without a base hit, I think, was 32 times, 0 for 32. And yet that same year, 
I hit 350. Rookie of the year, twice batting champion, five-time All-Star, National League champion in 1950. Remember, the Phils led Brooklyn by one game when they met in the final game of the season. Ninth inning, score tied at one. Brooklyn, two men on. Duke Snyder singles to center, and Ashburn throws Cal Abrams out at home. It wasn't a tough play. It's a play that I had practiced probably hundreds and hundreds of times. It was a, what it was, was a, a routine play at a crucial time. The Phillies went on to win the pennant that year, and Ashburn went on to hit 308 in his career. Since 1963, he's been a Phillies announcer, one who finds a silver lining in most everything. Had this happened 20 years ago, my grandchildren wouldn't have been able to see it. So now they're, they're seeing it, and I, I'm pleased about that. Okay, well. He made his debut as a 1948 National League Rookie of the Year. He was a two-time National League batting champion, and after a great 14-year playing career, he moved into the broadcast booth for the very same team he played for. Hello again, everyone. I'm Fran Ely, and welcome to the Halls of Fame. In the next half hour, we'll sit down and talk with one of the original Philadelphia Phillies whiz kids, Richie Ashburn. <laughs> Pressure and stress, they can bring on acid indigestion. You need powerful relief. Rolaid can absorb 47% more acid than regular Tums. And it works fast when life puts the screws to you. Rolaid spells relief. In 1948, Richie Ashford packed his bags and traveled to a Philly training camp. The camp was overflowing with young ball players, all hoping to prove themselves under the watchful eyes of the Major League Scouts. Richie was no exception. Before he could follow his dream of playing professional baseball, he first had to make the cut. I played on an outstate team, they call it. Uh, and we competed every year with the good teams from Omaha and Lincoln. They usually, if they didn't win the state championship, this club did that I played on. And uh, those teams got a lot of attention from major league scouts. So I was well scouted. And you gotta remember, once again, I was a catcher, being scouted as a catcher. And uh, then they, they had what they called the uh, Esquire Magazine All-America Boys Game, where a team west of the Mississippi played against a team east of the Mississippi. They played that game in New York. I was selected to represent the state of Nebraska. And there were some guys on that particular team that did wind up making the major league. Billy Pierce was on that team. Irv Polika was on that team, and there were there were a few others. Uh, but uh, so I was probably scouted by at that time there were 16 major league clubs. I was probably scouted by a dozen of their scouts. So you know they they knew of us, but you still you still have to make something you have to sign well i eventually signed of course uh with the phillies one of the scouts that saw you in the esquire game signed no no i was i did talk to uh, 
the Brooklyn Dodgers, one of their scouts, was there, and, and I wound up in, the, in Mr. Ricky's, all Branch Ricky's office, uh, talking to him, and uh, it's funny, he, he, here's a guy who's supposed to be the greatest judge of baseball talent who ever lived, and he, after he showed me all the catchers that the Dodgers had in the organization, we're talking about Goodwin Campanella, uh, Gil Hodges was a catcher then, Bruce Edwards was there, and, and a few more, really, uh, Rube Walker. Uh, after he showed me all those catches and made it very clear that the Dodgers didn't particularly need catches, <laughs> he said, uh, uh, son, if I were you, I'd go back in Nebraska and do what you're going to do before he wanted to be a ball player. <laughs> so, but, you know, when you're, when you're, I was 17 years old, and when you're 17 years old, that, there isn't much that will deter you if you have the desire and inclination to be a ball player. And I, I mean, I was, I hadn't even been tested yet in, in any type of pro ball. I wasn't about to give up trying to play. What was it like when you were signed? Well, it was, it was no big deal. Uh, I mean, it, it was kind of nice that uh, the people where I lived were were pretty happy about it. My family was pretty happy about it. But it really doesn't mean anything just because you sign. You have to go out, and then you have to play, and you have to accomplish something. So, but but we were very pleased about that. And uh, but it was a lot different than I thought it would be. I signed. I did not sign a Phillies contract. I signed a Phillies minor league contract in Utica, New York, uh, which was in the Eastern League at the time. Well, I thought, well, I'd play my first professional year at Utica, New York. I didn't, I didn't know that they can farm me out too, which they, which they uh, wanted to do. But I, uh, Eddie Sawyer, who was my manager in the minor leagues at Utica. Uh, good man, greatest, greatest man I've ever seen as a manager. He said, well, it was in spring training, he said, well, let me keep this kid around a little bit. Uh, you know, he can run, he can do this, and he can do that. So I did stay around, and I did play my first uh, professional year at Utica, New York. Now, that was a Class A league, and then they had B, C, and D league. They don't have that anymore. So there was some room underneath that A-League. In fact, the, the Utica team, the A-League, was the Phillies' highest minor league team. They didn't have a double-A team or they didn't, they didn't have a triple-A team. So all our good minor leaguers were at, wound up at Utica, New York, and we had a very good team there. We won a, a pennant and a playoff of both years we were there and won it rather easily. When were you notified you were going to go into the major league? Well, the Phillies in 1948 had a special minor league training camp for their prospects. The Yankees used to do that. I can remember Mickey Mantle being involved in that years ago. Uh, they were their outstanding prospects brought to spring training so the big club could get a look at them and not to make the team or anything, but to just kind of play along and, you know, get a little better feel of what the, the, the major league system is. And that's, uh, I went down there uh, as a, the property of Toronto, who was a, a triple-A club then, with the idea that I would go down and work out and then wind up at Toronto because I had had an excellent year in the year of 1947. I hit 362 in the minor league. But I was going to play at AAA. Well, the Phillies had uh, the batting champion in 1947. was Harry Walker of the Phillies. But he was holding out. He was the center fielder. And by that time, I had been moved from behind the plate to center field in, in the minor league that happened. But... Harry Walker was holding out for more money. <laughs> he told me one thing, he was only making about $12,000, and he wanted 
to make 20. So that's what he was holding out for. But he, so they needed a center fielder while he was holding out. Well, so I, I went in there and I, I, I hit very well in spring training, won some games for him. And I could fly. I mean, I could really fly defensively. And it, I was catching everything in sight. Now, Harry Walker was a nice center fielder, but he was getting late in his career. And he didn't, have, he didn't cover that much ground, so the pitchers were very happy about having me out there. And uh, I did so well in spring training that they almost had to keep me there. You know, I'm, I mean, I was four or five games in a row, I win with base hits, or I was this and that. And, uh, however, they had me slated for Toronto. And I can remember, they told me that they, when they had the meeting to see who was going to stay with the club at the end of spring training, they were going to send me down. And I remember Benny Benga, who was a silly coach, and he was ex-teammate of Babe, Babe Ruth with the Yankee, Benny Benga was a nice fellow got up in the meeting he said he said if you send this kid out I don't want nothing to do with this organization he's earned the right and so they kept me uh, and, uh, and of course I stayed there that's how I first got my chance Richie what do you remember the positive moments of your major league career and I know there's many I, when Dick Sisler hit a three-run home run in the top of the 10th inning in Ebbets Field in 1950, that's a very positive moment because it won a National League pennant against the Dodgers. I, I would say that would be, that would stand out in my mind uh, because of what it meant to all of us. We were young and we had battled very hard and we were in danger of losing what we one there, and that was that was a tremendous moment. I, I, you know, I've had so many positive things happen in this career. The batting titles, the the, uh, the awards that I've won, and, and awards really don't mean much. They just seem to happen when you keep playing. But. Uh, it just, this is such a great business. Uh, most people in it are nice people. Most people that come to see it at ballpark, there are nice people to work for and nice people to work with. Uh, this baseball has been pretty much my profession. As an adult, I, I played professional ball two years in the minor leagues, 15 years in the majors, and am in my 33rd year as a broadcaster. I also wrote the two Philadelphia newspapers for 20 years. I mean, this has really been a, a quite, this has been my, my lifestyle, certainly. And uh, almost it's almost all been a big plus, a big positive. As far as um, broadcast, horrific career in Philadelphia. Looking back, what runs through your mind? Well, I turned this job down at broadcasting when it was offered to me 33 years ago. I, I didn't think I wanted to... When I retired as a player, I thought I wanted to retire from anything that had anything to do with the field or games. And... Uh, they offered me this job in the off season, and I had announced my retirement as a player. And they said to me, "said Well, this was a new job. I wasn't taking anybody's place. They had never had a so-called color announcer in Philadelphia." And they said, "Well, you know, it's December. You got two or three months of spring training. Think about it." So I thought about it. Well, you know how you know how it is when January rolls around and February rolls around. And you get that, that baseball itch. Well, that's what I got, and I said, "Hey, I'm going to try this." Here I am, 33 years later.
You say you can't start exercising until you get some workout equipment? Well, guess what? You already have it. A reminder from the American Heart Association that ordinary physical activities can help reduce your risk factors for heart disease. Call 1-800-AHA-USA-1 and learn how to get in on the action. Although his career numbers alone could have put him in the Hall of Fame, Ricky Ashburn's trip to Cooperstown was littered with obstacles. Things looked especially bleak when after 15 tries, Ricky's name was removed from the ballot. But if there's one thing he learned during his career, it's that you never give up. I think I'm the only guy in there who was taken off the ballot for a period of three years and then voted into the Hall of Fame. How did that make you feel when they took you off the ballot? I didn't think it was fair. Now, I never reacted much to the vote. Uh, I have no problem with the vote. If you were eligible and they voted on you and they, and they didn't think you were good enough, I have no problem with that. I had a problem when they took me off the ballot because that wasn't fair. They, the day they took Pete Rose off the ballot, they took me off the ballot. But nobody knew about it. And uh, it had to do with the percentage of the vote that you received from the baseball writers when you were eligible from the baseball writers. Now, the most, I had 40-some percent of the vote. That's the highest percentage I ever got. Well, the, rule, the new rule was, if you didn't get 60% of the vote, you were taken off the ballot. Uh, but that probably wasn't a fair rule to pass now and throw a blanket over the previous 45, 50 years of ball players who were voted on under entirely different rules. But they did that, and they held that. Uh, they maintained it for about three years, and then the Hall of Fame committee decided it, the rule wasn't fair. Uh, I think when they found out that there's a good many of the players that are in the Hall of Fame didn't receive anywhere near 60% of the vote uh, and got in the Hall of Fame. I think they figured that wasn't fair, and it really wasn't a fair rule. What's the Hall of Fame mean to you if you can get all the stuff on the periphery out? What does the Baseball Hall of Fame itself mean to Richie Ashman? Well, it's, you know, it's a great honor if you're a player. I know that. I'm not a fool. Uh, probably wouldn't mean as much to me as it meant to, uh, uh, as it's going to mean to Mike Smith, who was the first ballot Hall of Famer, more votes, total number of votes than anybody ever received. Uh, I mean, he ought to feel pretty good about that. You know, there are Hall of Famers and there are Hall of Famers. I mean, I was voted in by the Veterans Committee. I wasn't voted in by the baseball writers and at one time was taken off the ballot. So I, I feel very fortunate to have, you know, received this, this honor. But they didn't exactly carry me in there on sedan chairs either, you know? <laughs> During his playing days, Richie Ashburn was something of a Philadelphia celebrity. Today, as a Philly broadcaster, his status is close to legendary. Richie's passion for the Phillies and for the city of brotherly love itself make him a fan favorite. He may no longer be a whiz kid, but as a broadcaster, he's still part of the game he loves so much. For the Halls of Fame, I'm Fran Healy. So long, everybody. Mm -hmm.